just make sure I can. Just trying to change the screen. Here we go. Um, so the aim of tonight's presentation is effectively provide context to the existing report. So we've got all that good information that's been put within to the report. And I thought the probably the most benefit for us um, in terms of the presentation tonight is to, to put the report into context and answer a couple of key questions like, why, why does Bogoyga Creek look and behave like it currently does? And what can we do to manage the creek moving forward? And this is a photo of Bogoyga Creek. And I'll, I'll be good if we could keep a, a, a bit of a snapshot of this particular uh, image in our, in our mind moving forward, because it's a classic sort of uh, profile of the creek within this reach. And when we think of river systems, as Sal sort of introduced before, the, the concept of geomorphology is effectively just the, the formation of landscapes over time, influenced by uh, water and gravity. And so you look at all the different interactions and influences that contribute to, to the formation of a waterway, and there's quite a lot of them. And there's the floodplain, the geology, the sediments, so the nature of the sediments in the bank profile and across the catchment the amount of rainfall, uh, the habitat, the hydraulics and the vegetation. And all of those things linking together form the, the geomorphology or that, the sort of physical aspects of a river system. And when you put it down to its most basic concepts, basically a, a river system is formed through the influence of gravity and water, which influences the sediment that then results in the, the formation of the, the different topography within a a waterway system and then that sort of leads to um, the processes of erosion and deposition and the transport of the sediment within the water column and that basically leads to a continually changing landscape that forms the basis of our river systems and we can there's various influences that can be formed upon our rivers that are either natural or man-made that also have the, the ability to change how our river systems act and behave. And the ability for a river systems to respond sort of depends on how robust the stream is. So sometimes some water courses are more sensitive to change and other waterways aren't as sensitive to change. And this is a, a good diagram of how we sort of visually think of river systems, um, particularly under pre-European conditions where it's sort of in this balance or this this equilibrium, state of equilibrium. And then there might be some sort of threshold that's reached. Uh, it could be a large flood. It might be some man-made intervention and something changes and it tips the scale out of balance. And then the river then tries to respond to return to some form of equilibrium. And that may not be the same condition that it was prior to that disturbance. So mining is a classic example or large floods sometimes where there's a, uh, an activity or a disturbance that occurs and then that river system has changed forever. And moving forward, that river may want to um, return to some form of equilibrium that's different to what it was prior to that, that disturbance. And this is a really good diagram um, that represents how complex river systems can sort of be. And it, it really doesn't matter about the actual words that are on the screen in this instance. But we, we often hear the phrase, that log fell in the river and it caused that erosion, or that tree there is causing the erosion, or the deposition on, on one side of the creek is causing the erosion on the other side of the creek. And, and one of the key lessons I try and get across to, to the community when I'm talking to them about river systems, in, in most circumstances, there's not a simple cause and effect um, relationship between a particular disturbance and what has actually caused that disturbance. So if we use channel depth as an example, where if somehow through an erosion process, the, the channel deepens, and in response to that, you have the ability to change all these other different aspects of the, the channel geometry and um, hydraulic conditions within the stream. And so it's an important sort of fact to sort of remember. And then this is, a, this is one of my favourite diagrams that we use quite a lot. And it's, it's, it's this 
um, image is very, very different to Bogoigi Creek, but it's, it's what we call a LIDAR image of the Murray River up near Howlong. And the feature that you're sort of seeing there is basically, uh, or the image that you see there, is an uh, image of the topographic surface of the floodplain. So effectively all the, the bumps and the depressions across the floodplain surface of the Murray River and it removes all uh, the vegetation. So it's effectively just the, the surface that you can see in that image. And in that purpley blue color is the, the floodplain surface. And what, what you can see there is over tens of thousands of years, that river's moved right across that floodplain surface and you get all these different um, features that are superimposed upon one another that are formed over thousands and thousands of years. And that will be, um, basically going on, you know, indefinitely moving forward for, you know, thousands and thousands of years more. And so you can sort of see that if we intervene um, on that river system in one particular way, there's a lot of complex um, processes at play that um, sort of influence what, we're, what can happen and what we sort of see moving forward. So in context of Bogoigi Creek, uh, what are the key waterway processes that we say? And most commonly when we talk about erosion processes, people think of bank erosion processes. But quite commonly, one of the most uh, uh, active erosion processes that occurs across river systems, across you know, most of the Australia and indeed certainly up the, the east coast of Australia, relates to, to bed erosion processes. And bed erosion processes often form in the, or often are evident in the formation of what we call these earthen waterfall features called head cuts or nick points. And if you can see my mouse there, you'll see one of those waterfall features in this image of a head cut here. And so if, if you think of a normal uh, waterfall, it's exactly the same as that. Waterfalls are effectively that same bed erosion process that's occurring on a much slower time scale. So those waterfall features will basically move in an upstream direction. And when they're in bedrock, like we most commonly sort of think of them, they might move, you know, a kilometre every million years or something like that. And within a, a waterway environment, those features can move between metres per year to um, you know, kilometres per year, depending upon um, if we have a, a significant flow event. And effectively what happens is that they, they form through some form of disturbance, and that can be either land clearing or uh, so catchment clearing of the, the catchment upstream and generating much more runoff than what they would have got naturally, or um, uh, mining, uh, channel straightening, or some sort of uh, structure that might be uh, constructed in the bed of the creek that initiates one of these features. And effectively what they do is they propagate back in an upstream direction. And this is a classic photo of what, what, uh, what results in the channel once these um, features form. So in this image, we're looking in an upstream direction. So the water's flowing towards us in that image. And you can, can notice that the channel on the downstream side of the head cut is much bigger than what it is on the upstream side of the, of the head cut. And what that means is that it has, it's basically a larger amount of flow can stay within the channel on the downstream side versus the upstream side. And so not only do you get the bad erosion sort of forming because of the, the initiation and sort of formation of that head cut, but you get a greater channel capacity below the head cut, which basically concentrates flow more than it otherwise would have, which also has the ability to increase the erosion potential on the downstream side of the head cut. And so what we tend to see is the bed deepening in the first instance, and then bank erosion occurring on both sides of the channel on the downstream side of the head cut. And it comes a bit of a self-perpetuating cycle. And once once this feature forms, it has the ability to permanently alter the shape and um, uh, characteristic and trajectory. So what it's going to look like moving forward indefinitely. And this is another example of what happens. So um, 
this particular image, which is sort of reproduced from the, the report, shows that you have a head cut form. It sort of propagates back in an upstream direction, which is on the left side of the page. And it generates a lot of sediment er eroding from that particular area. And further downstream the system, you, you get some deposition occurring. And in response to that channelization, you also see a change in the, the plan form of the river or the channel quite commonly. And so in the context of the Goiti Creek, particularly in those straightened sections, uh, you get that head cut that may have initiated in those straight sections and it propagates in an up, upstream direction and it over steepens the stream. And in response to that over steepening, the creek tries to lengthen its gradient or reduce its slope. And how it does that is by starting to get, starting to meander and develop a meandering pattern. And, and this sort of process is not just uh, restricted to Bagoyi Creek, but it's a common in Hodgson's Creek, uh, also Boggy Creek, 15 Mile Creek is a classic example. So around Greeter, through, um, where that used to be a swamp and it was channelized. And effectively, it sets the stream off in a, 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 a tr quite a different trajectory for change than what it otherwise would have been. And this is a, another example sort of looking in a cross-sectional view of what, what that trajectory or evolutionary process is likely to look at. And it's quite, quite relevant to Bagoigi Creek. And so uh, the first image up the top there basically shows a a natural channel that was would have looked something like this prior to European disturbance. It's not exactly the same as what Bagoyi Creek may have looked like, but in general, it's a, a reasonable representation. And then in response to that um, uh, influence of either channel straightening or land clearing, um, the first, the first um, change we see is we start to get that bare deepening process that we spoke about earlier. And then in response to that deepening, you start to get erosion of the, of the banks on both sides. So not only is it deepening, but the channel is widening. And you can see that the channel starts to get quite large and much larger than it would have been prior to, its, prior to that disturbance. And then over time, it starts to develop that sinuosity or that meandering again as it starts to try and reduce its overall length. Uh, or gradient through the system. And once that starts to happen, we start to see little inset depositional features form. And that can be in the form of uh, sandy point bars or uh, finer sediments forming a bit higher to, to create these little inset floodplain surfaces. And you can see them in some aspects of Bagoya Creek. And then finally, we get to the point of what they have called here is quasi equilibrium, which is basically the channel is fully adjusted and it's reached that uh, equilibrium um, back. It's back into balance, like that, um, that that image showed earlier of the scales. But it's somewhat different to that original setting that it was um, prior to that disturbance. Um, in in context of Bagoyi Creek, most of the system is still sort of within this deepening and or deepening and widening stage. They're the most common um, phases, I suppose, that the Gordy Creek is in at the moment. And that's still you know, a very long time after the point of disturbance. So, so these processes, this to, to go through that evolutionary process, is, um, it doesn't just take years, it can take decades to centuries in response to that. So an example of uh, Hodgins Creek, um, through there where you've had that disturbance through mining, whilst that influence occurred 100, 150 years ago, that process will still be occurring or that trajectory of a change or that evolutionary process that we're referring to here will still be going um, 100, 150 years from now, most likely. And this is the, the photo that we had of Bagoigi Creek and it's an example of those processes that we've we've shown before. So you can see where, where the water is. We've got that little low flow channel where the bed is deepened. And those little grassed areas where the revegetation is and where those established trees are, are basically floodplain surfaces that are formed through, uh, as opposed to deposition, they've occurred through the, the dropping of the stream bed. 
and you've got this little inset floodplain formed and then this surface up above where the fencing is is the old floodplain surface and it takes uh it's it's less connected to the floodplain now this surface up here so it takes a, a much bigger flow event than what it would have prior to that disturbance to get out of bank and when you have that higher energy flow contained within the channel it sort of goes through that um perpetual sort of or self um, perpetual um, process where it, it makes that erosion worse and the bare decision the bed incision that we sort of see can occur not just in a single site or a narrow reach it can happen across the entire um, waterway system as is the case across Bagoigi Creek and so this is another another way of conceptualizing the, the bare erosion process that we're talking about that there was a relatively small channel prior to that disturbance feature and then in response to the disturbance that that erosion is propagated all the way up through this channel and it also starts to to, to propagate upstream within the tributaries as well so the original disturbance may not have occurred in these little little tributary systems but in response to that deepening in the primary stream or the trunk stream it also then propagates up the, the the tributaries as well and so you can get a disturbance that's initiated from one particular site and it impacts upon a whole reach or a whole catchment scale and just to articulate that process or conceptualize that process i'll um show a couple of videos and um, maybe sell, yell out if these don't come up, if that's okay. Just loading, I hope. Bear with me. Got a very snowy scene at the moment, Julian. Yeah, sorry, Sal. They were working. No, that's good. Always is the way they were working before. Yes, we we did a test run through these movies earlier today to make sure that they'd work across Zoom. So yeah, it's worth waiting for because I think they do conceptualise exactly what you're talking about really well. Yeah. What I might do, Sal, is if I keep going and yep. perhaps I'll sort it out as we as we keep talking. They might even start in the background. I don't know why they're not starting, I'm sorry, but this is a good lesson. Anyway. No, that's okay. We did give it a run through, so we'll we'll come back to the come back to the movies. Probably start in the in the background as we're as we're talking. So we'll move on, but I'll I'll come to that. I'll come back to that. So as we were saying before, the the primary process of erosion that's occurring in. Um, the Gorgi Creek is that bare deepening process. But there's also other forms of erosion that can you know, occur and, and sometimes that is a symptom or in response to that bare deepening process that's been uh, initiated. And one common form of erosion that is relevant to the Gorgi Creek, particularly as we start moving through that uh, evolutionary process of the deepening, the widening, and then starting to try and lengthen is what we call meander extension or lateral migration and they're, they're most, that, that erosion process is most common on um, you think of the Murray River or the Ovens River where you see that outside bend erosion and you get the deposition across the inside bends and so as Bagoiga Creek starts to try and lengthen in response to that straightening process you start to see this particular meander extension process occurring and so it's important to sort of note that, you know, you ask yourself, is, is erosion bad, well, or good? And in, in this particular instance in Pagoygi Creek, what, what this particular process is sort of showing or demonstrating that the creek is starting to, 
work towards reaching that new equilibrium. And it's a, a process of recovery, effectively. So in this particular instance, that um, erosion is actually working towards increasing a river health um, goal. And the other one that can occur is the, the channel widening, which we touched about before. And again, that's, that's sort of a step back in the, the process of that incised evolution model that we've, that we've brought up on the screen. And effectively, that can occur in response to the bed deepening and then you get the undercutting of the bank toe, which leads to the, the, the erosion on both sides of the creek. But that form of erosion can also just occur in response to um, a large flow event, for instance. So you have a big, big uh, rainfall event like we saw in 2018, and sometimes instead of the bed deepening and then getting the widening, you can get the whole channel just enlarge in response to that flow event as a channel accommodates that incre or that rapid and short-term increase in flow, and one of the erosion, um, I suppose, mechanisms that sort of contribute to that is that we, we often think of erosion being caused purely by the act of flowing water against the bank. But in some of these systems, particularly the, the streams that are either sand bed streams or even coarser bed loads, so where we start getting into gravels and cobbles, it's that material that also gets picked up and moved through the, the water column or the channel and in some river systems, it, you can hear the, the roar of the rolling rocks during the high flow event, like a, a rolling clap of thunder, I suppose. And um, that's why all these rocks in this particular image are round, is that they've been picked up and all rolled and bounced along the ground. And if, if, that, um, if those bits of rocks sort of get picked up and are hitting the bed and they're hitting the banks, they actually cause abrasion against the bank profile and the bed profile and contribute to erosion as well. There's a, a river system in Tassie that um, I inspected after 2016 and they had uh, rocks bigger than um, basketballs that had got picked up and lifted out of a, a river system and sort of deposited about two or 300 metres away from the, the river bank and um, that sediment was two or three metres deep and so you can imagine all the, the force that sort of contributed and a bit of erosion that occurred within the channel um, due to the energy within that system at the time. Um, and that, that basically summarises the erosion processes in the first part of the presentation. So it's probably a good spot there to stop and ask if there's any questions. We did have a question, Julian. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Cecily. Cecily asked, um, can you discuss how the process of bank erosion is accelerated by the meandering and undercutting of banks? Which and you then you, did, of course. Which I think, which I <laughs> think I Julian it? has done. But, it, but the second part of your question, Cecily, is um, I think is still really relevant. What are the impacts of variable flow patterns on bank erosion? Um, it, it can be like, complex. Are there particularly dominant flows, which are the, the active ones in removing materials? That's probably... Yeah, that's a, a really, really good question. Um, so I'll, I'll answer the second question first, if that's all right. Um, so er erosion potential, like we, we hear of um, uh, different sort of hydraulic parameters that can sort of be used to predict erosion and we often we often simply th think of the speed of the water that might be the the erosion predictor so velocity um, of water and that's that's not really a good representation of um, erosion potential but we do use um, a couple of other parameters called shear stress in particular but also stream power and stream power is um, sort of there's been a bit of a a stream power analysis that was done in the report that was prepared for the Gorgie Creek. And, and basically, in its simplest terms, like stream power is a function of, of slope and depth um, in particular, but also um, the, the area of a channel that's um, wetted, I suppose, during a flow event. And so um, a couple of things. So the, the steeper the stream is, the more likely 
it's going to erode in terms of simply uh, in terms of the hydraulic conditions. Um, the the larger the channel capacity and the 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 deeper the water you get is also sort of influencing its potential for erosion relative to these flow events. So um, if we're if you can still see my screen, which I think you can, and I'll just put it back onto presentation mode. So in this in this particular instance, Bogoigi Creek, say pre-European, was a much smaller channel. And and in response to that, that deepening and widening, we've got a much bigger channel capacity within this system. So instead of just making a, an assumption, instead of getting a, uh, a flow that is... Um, you know, often a, a bankful channel capacity in a, a stream so is naturally about a one in two year flow event in southeastern Australia. Um, that channel capacity in this instance would be far greater than that. And so you might actually see that a, a 20 year flow event or a 50 year flow event, or even in some systems, I'm thinking a 15 mile creek around um, uh, Greater South near the school there, the, the water is contained within the, the channels for a hundred year flow event now, uh, which just naturally wouldn't have occurred. And so that that has basically concentrated the flow in a narrow area, which increases the hydraulic forces that have contributed to erosion. So basically in this instance here, yeah, the, the, the fact that we've got a, a greater channel capacity has increased the erosion potential. But in a, in a natural system, um, when what sort of flow event do you get that might you know cause the most erosion and it's a combination between um, basically how frequent those flow events are so sometimes the cumulative effect of uh, a two-year flow event that occurs every two years might cause you know a, a, a two-year flow event that occurs 10 times over a 20-year period for instance might cumulatively cause more erosion than a uh, a flow event that occurs once every 20 years, which is going to be a bigger flow. Um, and then the third element of that in, in terms of depth relates back to, to the discharge, I suppose. So um, you can imagine in this particular stream, you might get a flow event that runs to the top of bank, and that might be a um, you know, one in five year flow event, for instance, a one in 10 year flow event. Um, just using that as an example. But the one in 100 year flow event might cause water to, to spread further across the floodplain, but it doesn't actually increase the depth of flow particularly much. And therefore, um, whilst you have a much larger uh, discharge or a volume of water that's passing through a particular site, it's spread out over a much wider area and therefore um, doesn't necessarily cause as much erosion as some of those smaller flow events that sort of remain, result in a, a similar depth of flow uh, within a, cha a channel at a particular point. Um, so that, that's sort of, you know, how can hydraulics, I suppose, influence erosion. And then we've got the other influences such as vegetation and sediment type and um, natural bedrock controls and all those other elements that then get brought in like we sort of showed that diagram before that can also influence floods but um, in a nutshell that's sort of uh, the answer to the second question and I've forgotten the first question sorry. I think we addressed the first part in in part of your presentation Julian um, just you touched briefly on um, soil type then and and you did mention in the presentation you know sand bed systems and gravel and cobble bed systems can behave quite differently i guess in the context of bank erosion what are our more resilient sediments on in banks and what are our least resilient and how might that affect how they perform like to me that looks like a really cohesive clay bank in this photo um, but, you know, what's, what's your experience with different soil types and bank erosion? Yep. So, thanks, Sal. So, effectively, in its most simplest terms, the, the most cohesive sediments or the, the ones that are, are less prone to erosion are the smaller sediment sizes. So, the, the silts and the clays. And because they're smaller, they sort of bind together um, and resist erosion much more compared to the, the coarser sediment fraction so the 
the sands, the gravels, the the cobbles, um, which are you know getting bigger and bigger and bigger. However, there's there's sort of complexities around that as well, and it's one thing to think about in terms of um, bank stability and relating that back to the bank sediments. These floodplains have formed over thousands of years of sediment coming from upstream across the catchment and depositing across the floodplain and slowly building up layer after layer after layer on top of the, the floodplain. And, you know, pre-European, all of those floodplains would have been fully vegetated, which influenced um, the shape and the, the nature of the sediment and the amount of sediment that's deposited over time. And, and when it's sort of sitting there for thousands and thousands of years, gravity sort of makes it compress and compress and compress. And so those, those sediments that are naturally there have compressed over a point in time that they become naturally more consolidated. So you can imagine that if you put um, some loose clay material exactly the same next to a cohesive bank material, of, you know, that same sediment type, the, the, cohesive, the, the consolidated sediments are going to be less prone to erosion than that material that you've um, simply placed in that same area on the bank profile. So that, that's one aspect of when we will get into it sort of shortly and we start talking about um, bank battering, for instance. Um, if you batter a bank, you, you sometimes loosen that consolidated sediment and if you have a flow event sort of passing over it, once you've disturbed it through that battering process, you can, in fact, um, result in an increased rate of erosion rather than um, preventing erosion. But we can sort of get into that um, a little bit more further down the track. Another, another aspect of um, the sediment cell that I sort of see in, in this particular image is the, the chemicals within the soil. And so... If you're looking straight at that yellow sediment in the bank face where we've got that little those rills sort of forming and that's that's what we call dispersive sediments and so there, there are erosion processes in bank profiles that are not reliant on the act of flowing water past the bank profile but simply by um, being wet it can actually cause erosion and that's that's what dispersion and another process called slaking is and you can sort of most simply test for that by just breaking a bit off and putting it in the water. And if you start to see bubbles and the, the, the sediment sort of breaking up or creating a little cloud of um, sediment just sort of starts to float away, um, that that's actually a erosion process in its own right. And those soils are usually, um, well, in a pre-disturbed environment, they're not usually exposed. And so... They're quite difficult to treat once they are exposed, but again, require some sort of um, cover to minimise that exposure to water in its own right. Um, does that answer those questions, yeah, Sal? I think that's excellent, Julian. Did you want to try those, those videos? videos again? Yeah. yeah, I have a few. Um, it's a, a, it's a look. Let me go that's back. Uh, Turn my, turn my video on so it doesn't feel so lonely. I'm staring at the screen of nothing. So the video that um, Julian was hoping to play is, is basically um, a movie of a waterway over in America between, I think it's 1939 and uh, 1990 something. So it's over a 60 year trajectory and it just shows a real process of, of going from a straight channelized system into a, a tightly meandering waterway and how that over time actually slows down the flow and, and the development of those meanders actually starts to aid in that recovery, which is what Julian was talking about. What I might do, so it's, it's the program's not wanting to, to play for some reason. I might, once we get to the conclusion and- um, Yeah. Craig might have to sing us a song or something and I'll, I'll shut my computer down and restart it. All right. I'm, well, I'm we'll sure continue, that'll fix it. But. Continue on with the next session, which is the, the practical advice around what we can do as landholders um, in terms of managing this system. I'll hand back to you, Julian. Thanks, Sal. So, uh, 
Sorry. There we are. So in, in context of that, those primary processes that we're speaking about earlier, um, the recommendations that were made in the Bagoogi Creek report, and this is the area that we sort of haven't focused on within this presentation um, because we can sort of read that um, in detail at a later date, but they, they make reference to the construction of new or the reconstruction or the repair of grade control structures. So in effect, they've recommended um, managing that bed erosion process in the first instance to um, basically halt the bed erosion and then the associated bank erosion that's occurring in response to that bed erosion process. And one of the one of the points that they make in that report, which is very, very true, is these structures, these grade control structures have a finite life, effectively. They're not going to last forever. And so like just about every other waterway management intervention aimed at erosion control, we're relying on vegetation establishment to provide that long-term uh, cost-effective erosion control. And so... The establishment of vegetation is effectively, in the long term, the most cost-effective um, solution to managing erosion or across a river system or a creek system. And in this instance, the the vegetation established, you know, can occur. There's there's obviously re remnant vegetation, the river red gums that are on the the top of bank, and so there is a natural seed source there. Um, but in some instances, it'll require revegetation works, some weed management and some stock exclusion. They also make reference to the removal of black willows and black willows are a, a special type of willow. They're a, a weed of national significance, but they're introduced in northeast Victoria in, I think it was the early to mid 80s. So they haven't been around that long and they're introduced as a form of rapid um, bank stabilisation, but since that time they've realised that they cause a lot of problems. And unlike the crack willow, I'm sure Sal's told you this many times, but unlike crack willow that can sort of break off and effectively flow down the water system, the river system or the creek system, drop out amongst a log or a rock or um, against the bank and propagate and regrow, black willow can grow from either that vegetative growth method or via seed. And so they're not reliant on um, the water to carry them around, but the, the wind will also carry and disperse the seed. And so they're quite an invasive weed, um, uh, or the weed and um, uh, type of willow. The report also made reference to the relocation of in-stream debris blockages. Uh, sometimes you can get large wood that gets picked up and mobilised um, in a, a particular flow event. That that re that um, large wood can be a very very valuable uh, feature in terms of both habitat and erosion management. Um, however, in some instances where the blockages uh, are quite discrete and large, they can actually cause localised erosion issues and I assume there's a couple of those within this system and possible bank battering and bank battering as we sort of spoke about before is a bit of a, a um, it's a bit of a 50-50 sometimes of, about whether it's appropriate or not and in this particular instance it's been recommended in the upper bank profile and it's in those areas that are less exposed to the more frequent flooding but where the bank profile is too steep to allow vegetation to become established on the bank face. And so they're recommending in some instances, you could do some bank battering to lower that upper bank profile and uh, which creates more favorable conditions for vegetation establishment. And as we move forward and we start talking about some of the, the best practice management techniques, you might hear the word resilience getting thrown around and um, certainly it's a term that's uh, sort of probably initially had some really good um, context associated with it but slowly over time it, it, it's getting hijacked and uh, the definition of resilience is, is taking on a different meaning but 
Um, in, in terms of our waterway systems, when we talk about catchment resilience, we're effectively talking about uh, a river system's ability to, to go back to what it was, um, in inverted commas, because it, sometimes it won't be able to go back to exactly what it was, but it's its ability to cope and return to a healthy functioning system um, following a, a, a disturbance such as a flood event. Um, and, and that not necessarily just relate to um, the, the river system in, in, in terms of primarily river health aspects, but it can also relate to the land management aspects, how we interact and we're sort of sit adjacent to these river systems. And so when we talk about resilience of, of um, waterways, we talk about um, healthy, it's effectively just describing a healthy river system as a resilient river system. And usually that involves a continuous riparian vegetation cover um, on, on and adjacent to the creek. Um, it incorporates large wood in the stream that slows the flows down and creates little depositional and erosion features, but it doesn't sort of cause whole, um, wholesale change in the, in the position um, of a bank or a, an entire channel in some in some instances and it also um, a resilient waterway is able to cope with droughts better so you're able to have those features that provide habitat during periods of low flow and drought periods and so going back to the techniques of managing the bed degradation processes within the Doige Creek the you, you, you would have noticed that there's a series of grade control structures in the form of rock shoots that are present within Bagoigi Creek. And if you think back to that evolution process that we were talking about earlier, where the bed starts to deepen, and in response to that, the, you start to get channel widening and the stream starts to meander or go bendy to reduce its stream length you can strategically place a series of rock shoots within the bed of the waterway to effectively mimic that, that result. And basically what it does, it's a form of intervention to artificially reduce the, the longitudinal gradient of a waterway um, to basically prevent um, that over in, you know, the further deepening, widening and that meandering. And so, this is a common technique that's been used to prevent that the waterways from going through that evolutionary path for, for decades, particularly in northeast Victoria. And it, what, what is a rock shoot? Well, effectively, it's a, it's a, a steep um, rock armoured feature that provides either a, a stable transition between a higher bed elevation to a lower bed elevation. So in this instance, it can be used to, to manage and control those head cut or nick point features that we sort of were talking about earlier. Or um, in this particular instance in Pagoygi Creek, they can be placed above the bed and effectively they're, they're in, which is quite applicable to this reach, is they're, they're basically a series of structures that provide that reduction in longitudinal gradient over an entire reach. And so it's important to point out at this point that a system like Bagoigi Creek requires a coordinated response and approach to managing these processes that we've been talking about rather than just an isolated ad hoc approach. And so to effectively manage this system, you require the strategic placement and sizing of those rock structures to make sure that we're providing that system or whole of reach response to managing those bare deepening processes in particular. That's probably a good spot to stop there, cell two, in terms of if there's any questions relating to that um, response to the, oh, actually, while we're talking about that, one, one thing I should bring up actually is, um, you know, we, we, we ask ourselves why do those well, why did those rock shoots fail in um, the 2018 flow event? And there, there's a couple of reasons for it. And one is that um, they, these structures are built knowingly to have a finite life. And so there's often a balance to be struck between 
how much it's going to cost to build these structures versus, um, you know, the return period or their, their design life. And so most commonly, these structures are designed to what we call a 20-year design flow event. And so in theory, um, they're only meant to last about 20 years as their maximum design life. And some of these structures, I think, are sort of constructed around 1990, that sort of vintage. And so they sort of naturally reaching that end of their design life anyway. And then another element of that was this, the size of the flow event that we got. And so um, the estimates at the um, Euro uh, evident, I think, um, bomb weather station was that the, the rainfall event that we got in December 2018 was about a one in two, one in 3,000 rain, year rainfall event. And so what that basically means, it's way off the charts compared to anything that we've ever ever seen before. And so the size of that rainfall event um, uh, certainly influenced the, the damage that we saw within both to these structures and within the Goyan Creek as a whole. And then thirdly, um, touching upon um, the vegetation management aspect is that Importantly, with all of these structures, whether they be rock-based structures or whether they be timber-based structures, it is that vegetation um, establishment side of things that's, that is aiming to provide that long-term uh, erosion control or erosion management. And so the failure to sort of incorporate that into these, um, into these type of works will eventually, well, most likely um, result in the eventual failure of... Um, of these structures in the long term. And so interestingly in the report and quite rightly, they put that stronger fo focus on that vegetation establishment as being the key to getting that um, stability within this particular system, which is supported by the construction or repair of these rock sheet structures over the short to medium term. Um, yeah, Not, is there any questions in relating to that? No, I think that's a, a great summary, Julian. I think I continue to talk about the other erosion management okay. options from there. Thanks, Sal. So there's there's other erosion control techniques, and as as we spoke about before, um, some of the, it's it's important that we when we do work aimed at river health or erosion control, where we're treating the cause and not the symptom of the problem. And um, one erosion control technique is sort of that stands out amongst most erosion control techniques because it's been so successful in the long term is, is rock beaching. And this is a rock beaching site that was done on the Ovens River just behind. Um, uh, it's the super cheap auto um, in Wangaratta against the, the Wangaratta levee. And... Rock armoring works so well because it's it's usually doesn't require the exact identification of the erosion mechanism that's occurring. However, um, in the case of the bare deepening process that we've been talking about, the rock armoring of the bank will do absolutely nothing in terms of managing the the um, the erosion within the bed of the creek, and so. Rock beaching like this, um, when we do our first pass at estimating costs at a particular site to supply, deliver, and then place the rock, you're looking about $100 a cubic metre. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's a little bit less compared to you know how far you've got to cart the rock. Um, but a site like this um, would be worth tens of thousands of dollars to protect that 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 length of bank, which might have been around 80 metres or something of that order. But effectively, the rock armouring works through providing a physical barrier between the act of the flowing water and the natural bank or floodplain material. And it's important when you're applying this technique, similar to the, the rock shoot technique or the bed grade control structures that we were looking at earlier, that you use the angular quarry rock the angular quarry rock works to provide an interlocking mass and it minimises the voids in amongst the rock work to, to prevent that interaction of the flowing water and the bank profile. Whereas rocks that you sort of see 
um, within a river system have been rolling around in the bed for thousands or hundreds or thousands of years and they've become rounded off over time and they tend to be highly mobile and don't sort of act um, in the same way as angular quarry rock. And another technique that is, you know, probably very, very common prior to the 1950s and um, is becoming more popular again is the use of log revetment. And this is an example of a log revetment site up on um, uh, Little Snowy Creek up in um, near Eskdale. And this particular site was somewhere where, you know, we don't or didn't want to see every outside bend of this particular creek uh, subject to, to rock beaching works. And there was an attempt to install large wood to temporarily manage that bank erosion that's occurred um, and establish vegetation behind it, which will provide that long-term form of erosion control. But this reach is also um, quite an active uh, fishing reach. And so we're trying to maintain the, the depth on those, the depth of the water or the holes or the pools on that outside bend and create sort of that uh, short to medium term erosion control while maintaining the, the fish habitat and complexity within that reach. And often this, this timber, uh, one of the things that makes this technique either viable or unviable, unviable is the, the um, ability to source suitable timber. And so um, in the 1800s, for instance, and right up to the 1950s, and even probably later, um, the timber that was used for this might have been cut um, immediately off the top of the bank, or it might have been sourced from the adjacent floodplain. And obviously, we can't do that anymore. And um, so the, these particular timbers have been sourced from um, uh, native plantations and used at that particular site. And then in, in terms of vegetation establishment across a waterway, um, there's two primary roles of vegetation in how it actually contributes to channel stability. And again, don't, don't worry too much about all the words that are on this page, but the, the two primary aspects are the, the roots of the vegetation and so effectively the influence of that vegetation to contribute to channel stability is, is one, very much influenced by the extent of the roots. And um, effectively those roots act to bind the soil together. And it's not just trees that are able to contribute to that stability of the, the bed or bank profile through the influence of the roots. But, you know, there's a lot of grasses and there's a lot of shrubs um, that have a really good root mass when placed together, they can actually provide um, more influence than a, a single large tree, for instance. The second way it can, uh, vegetation contributes to channel stability is through increased roughness. And you'll notice when you, you sort of watch water pass through a river system and you see that wh white water forming and that turbulent water forming and, and basically every time the, the water passes through some vegetation or through a bit of fallen timber or large rocks or bared rock or something like that, these, these barriers of resistance to flow features um, uh, or roughness as we, we talk about it in terms of river health, it's basically the water using up its energy on passing through and past and around those features within a within a channel or across the floodplain. And in the absence of those features, um, the water basically uses that energy to contribute to channel erosion. So on a broader scale, the more roughness we have in a waterway, the less ability the stream has to induce um, bed or bank erosion. And where do we place that vegetation is quite important. And going back you know, a decade or so, most commonly you'd see revegetation work sort of starting on the top of bank and working back from the top of bank. And in the context of the, the influence of vegetation that we spoke about earlier, you want to get that vegetation established in those areas where you know the erosion is more likely to occur. And so in context of Bedoiga Creek, we know that the bed's deepening 
we know that the bank is being undercut and you're seeing that channel widening occurring that's extending from the you know the bank face and then back from the bank face so it's really important to get the vegetation established in those areas to provide the most immediate influence on channel stability so if we're placing vegetation on the top of bank or beyond the top of bank that's that's great and it's going to be great in the long term but in terms of bang for buck and getting vegetation established and to the point that it's going to influence channel stability as early as possible we'd like to see vegetation get established on that bank toe or in the channel or um, across the bank face and then start concentrating on the the top of bank and beyond the top of bank which provides that more longer term influence and obviously you know different vegetation types are more suitable to different positions within the bank profile so you often have your your i always say ridges and seeds but we want to say sedges and reeds um where, where those sort of species are more likely to be able to cope with getting their feet wet for periods of time and so yeah, I often recommend to people, you know, have a look upstream and downstream or on the opposite bank of your creek and see what's sort of naturally establishing. And if they're naturally establishing in those particular areas, then you can quite commonly replicate that in your own revegetation efforts. And so, you know, moving from the bank toe up the bank face, you might start to transition into the grasses and the shrubs. And then beyond that in the top of bank and beyond, you can start looking at planting um, your larger tree species. Sort of acknowledging that in some systems like Bagoigi Creek, you, you do have a, a vertical bank profile. It's almost impossible to get vegetation established on the bank profile when it's near vertical. And in those instances, you do either start from the top of bank and work back from there, or as the report suggests, in those areas where in the upper bank profile that are um, vertical and are less exposed to, to flow events, you can consider sort of battering that back and trying to, to a, a suitable slope, one in two, one in three, sometimes one in one is sufficient, but um, certainly battering it back and um, yeah, to, a, to a, a slope that basically favours um, vegetation establishment. And then in terms of large wood, we've sort of spoken about that um, and the influence of it, but certainly the large wood as a feature adds to a, a healthy, resilient waterway system. And it works in, in several different ways. And, and one is that flow resistance that we're spoke, speaking about. So literally the water passing through it and over and under it slows the water down and it uses that energy to do that rather than cause erosion. But it also contributes to complexity within a waterway. So you get the the natural little variants of um, localised pools and then local bars, so deposition and erosion features forming, which add to the habitat um, for the little critters, both um, aquatic and sort of semi-aquatic or reliant, you know, terrestrial um, uh, fauna that might rely on aquatic um, fauna to survive. Um, and certainly, you know, most commonly we sort of uh, recommend just uh, if the large wood should be retained where it falls. Uh, occasionally you will need to um, uh, relocate that large wood to a more suitable location if it's causing, causing a site-specific issue. And then in terms of, we, we touched upon earlier, resilience in terms of river health, but certainly in terms of property or land management um, applications, it's worthwhile sort of highlighting in context of those erosion processes that we're speaking about, you know, the, the theme that's sort of coming out tonight. There's some, some pretty simple principles to apply to your water to minimise the risk of losing or damaging your infrastructure. And this applies to not not just private landholders, but to also utility companies and public infrastructure and the like. And this is a classic example of what we quite commonly come across where, you know, naturally we, we consider putting pump sites on outside bends where you're likely to get that increased depth of water um, and maximising the, you know, your ability to extract water out of a, a water bar, or waterway. But 
also there's a risk on those outside bends when we're talking about most common areas and mechanisms of erosion. You get that outside bend erosion, which puts our infrastructure at risk. And this is an example of where a pump site's fallen in as a result of that outside bend erosion moving back. Um, but it doesn't always just relate to, to private infrastructure, as we said. Um, it's very, very common to come across um, utility companies putting power poles on the outside bends of creeks and rivers, and um, you have a flood, and that power pole gets you know, partially uh, damaged or you know entirely collapses. And the several times that I saw this happen after the 2016 floods, the utility company comes along and plonks that um, electricity pole or telephone pole within two or three metres of the new top of bank alignment. And you know, they're just waiting for the next flood to come along and they're going to have to do it again. But with a little bit of smart planning, you can position your infrastructure um, where it won't be at risk of um, that erosion moving forward. And similarly, that, that image across the bottom right is um, the Gentle Annie Bridge up at Whitfield. And um, talking about rivers being dynamic systems that are always changing, we, we often put in bridges and we make the assumption that that river channel is going to stay in the exact same position indefinitely moving forward. And, and quite commonly, that's not the case. And this is an example of where the river is, the outside bend is eroded, taken out that um, bridge abutment and caused quite a significant problem up there for many, many months before they replace or increase the, put another span on that, that bridge. And, and finally, here's another image. This is one of my favourites of a, a backyard that's been positioned on an outside bend of a river and it provides the most beautiful setting. But unfortunately, in a flood event, the, the bank eroded and undermined this particular person's backyard. And um, not only is it a problem to try and address, but it makes it very, very difficult to address when there isn't that buffer to allow access into the site. And so in this particular instance, um, to provide protection for that backyard, we had to build a ledge of rock out within the, the river system to build you know, access for an excavator to start placing the rock, which increased the cost of that, um, the works at that site quite significantly. And then I thought I'd just touch upon monitoring um, very quickly before I, I conclude the talk. And um, a couple of themes that come out of this is that despite us spending a heap of money in terms of stream re rehabilitation activities, there's, there's not a lot of monitoring that gets undertaken. And, and that's sometimes understandable because there's specific buckets of money that are, and you guys as a land care group or groups would understand this, that there's, specific buckets of money to put out there for particular works, but there's very rarely any um, funding set aside for formal monitoring or evaluation of the works you do. And, and certainly in any works that you do, it's, it's a value component to learn um, or gather learnings from, from your work, even if the results are different to what you expected. And we're, we're sort of delivering a similar presentation to this um, the other day and we're talking about, um, you know, how this can be applied. And, and, and sometimes you get specialists like myself or Craig come out or Sal even um, to come out to your particular site. And it's the first time we see it or we see it under a particular set of circumstances. But you're sort of exposed to, to your creek um, every day. You're seeing it. And uh, it's important when we're sort of gathering our knowledge of how river systems uh, behaving that we take into account your years and years of observations of that particular site. Um, but sometimes it's not easy to sort of pick up changes if they're occurring gradually rather than through a episodic big flood or big bank collapse or something like that. And, my colleague was sort of talking about this the other day and I liked what he, what he, his analogy. And he was basically saying that, you know, you watch your kids grow up and um, you don't know, notice how they, you know, might change over a 12 month period when you see them every day, but you go and visit your niece and nephew after not seeing them for 12 months and you really notice those changes. And so sometimes it's really important to 
have methods of monitoring those gradual changes of your river system. And depending upon what types of uh, issues or works you might be monitoring, there's, there's different aspects that you might be focused on. And I can probably, for, for time purposes, I won't go through all of this, but I'm certainly happy to sort of send this on to Sal, uh, Sal for you to have a look at in terms of how you might monitor specific erosion processes or waterway management works to sort of aid in that monitoring. But I thought I'd, I'd show a couple of photos, and I, I think photos are just a fantastic way to to monitor our river systems. And this is an example of a couple of photos that, uh, for better or for worse, uh, could be used for monitoring. The, but what, what this sort of demonstrates is that photo on the bottom left is sort of looking across at a bank erosion site um, from low down in the profile and sort of looking obliquely across at the works and you, it's a very difficult sort of um, photograph to be able to judge any um, retreat in the bank profile with the exception of the sort of change in the features that you can see um, based on that angle but the second photo on the right is is a much more effective photo to be able to monitor change and usually it involves sort of setting up a, a consistent photo point that might be um, lined up with in that particular site, uh, there's a house in the background and or the fence line. So you've got those static features that you can line up with future photos and then also a reference point from which to judge that distance between, uh, in this instance, the eroding bank and that, that fence line. And so you can periodically capture photos of that site and be pretty well informed about, you know, how much it's retreating over what particular time. And that's it. Thanks, Julian. I think you've done an excellent job of trying to explain some really complex um, concepts to us in a really short amount of time with as much detail as we could provide. And I think that um, we've, that gives us a really good starting point to work forward. Have, has anyone got any questions at this point? You're welcome to turn your videos on. We're gonna, gonna have any questions for Julian now and then we're gonna pass over to Craig Hart from the North East CMA and we'll talk a little bit more about the maintenance of these structures. Um, I think from my point of view, I see that you guys have been really lucky to have had these structures in place for the last 30 years because of, you know, a one in 2000 year rainfall event, had they not been in place, might have seen the creek in, in a very different position. Um, and I think from that point of view, they've, they've really done their job um, and achieved what they set out to achieve. So this is really a new chapter moving forward now of how we how we look to manage the creek from there. Anyone have James, any questions? James near you, Sal. Hello, James. Fire away with your question. Um, yeah, I'm just interested in Julian's uh, assumption of the fencing out. And we come to the conclusion that on high steep banks, it's not not a, not really appropriate to put too much vegetation right up in the high high banks, but put in the bottom of the creek. Yeah, and that's yeah. Julian. Yeah, I, I I think it it depends upon what your objectives are for for doing the vegetation. Um, and so if it's it's for erosion control, the the most effective locations are those areas that are going to be subject to erosion processes. Um, and so certainly in that lower bank profile, if you can get vegetation established, that's where you're going to get the most bang for buck. The, the challenge is sometimes because it does get wetted more often and it is subject to, to flow that it can be more challenging to get that vegetation established. But, but certainly in terms of the erosion processes that we spoke about, the most commonly sort of influenced by that active flowing water. And so the vegetation way up on the high bank faces is not really going to give you the most cost effective or bang for buck influence in terms of getting that vegetation established. But, um, you know, the, the, the wider buffer that you can afford, the, the greater your insurance policy effectively. Um, but there is, you know, no problems with trying to get it established in the short term and the medium term closer to where it's going to influence channel stability and then work from there as you're watching your, your creek respond to that 
vegetation that's establishing. Thank yep. you. Any other questions before we move on? All right. And we will have some more time at the end as well. Sorry, James. James again. Yep. The only thing I'd say when Julian was saying about monitoring, we mustn't forget that there should be maintenance as well on some of these structures and whatever. Yep, yeah. that's a, a great point, James. And I think we might we might follow on with that through to um, Craig. Craig, would you like to turn your video on? Um, so we introduced Craig earlier. And Craig's a senior project officer with the North East CMA. And I'd asked and invited Craig along tonight to talk a little bit about the works on waterways process and what the CMA, I guess, have got in mind for the long-term maintenance for these for these structures. Happy to hand it over to you, Craig. Yeah, great, thanks, Sally. Um, Long-term maintenance, okay. Um, where to start? Well, I might just, can I share screen as well, please, Sally, if that's okay? Yep. Can yep. We... Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're right to go, Craig. Right do that, yep. Um, just let me know if you can see that. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. It's always hard to know. Is it starting? Oh, hang on a second. I think Have that's my fault. Not, um, yep. What's your name? Better? Great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, th look, th thank you very much. And thanks, Julian, for that um, presentation. It's really, yeah, it was great. Really informative and um, yeah, good to put things in perspective. Um, I just thought I'd just show uh, a chart really of, of the event that, that was experienced in December 2018, which is really a catalyst, I suppose, for where we are right now. I'm talking about, um, you know, the, the, the structures, the great control structures and, and the, um, the stability of the Gorgie Creek. And I mean, this particular chart here demonstrates um, you've got flow in cubic metres per second on your um, uh, y-axis or left hand side and down the bottom on your um, x axis you've got you know duration all the time that this flow occurred <clears throat> and you can see that on December the 2018 um, I think it was the 30th of December that very top line just demonstrates just off the charts really the event you know that we that we had on that particular particular 24 or 48 hours um, you know compared to if you look at our um, 1 in 20 year events um, which is a 5% AEP. Um, so what's that, your, I suppose, light blue line there, so quite bottom, about 100 cubic metres per second. Um, and I suppose, and that's what, what Julian touched on before, that's what these grey control structures were built for, a one in 20 year event, really. And so my point is, is that, you know, I've walked the whole, pretty much the whole length of the Gulgi Creek a couple of times now, um, and, and investigating these great control structures post the event. And yeah, sure, they're in, they're in poor condition. They need repair or replacement. But given the actual magnitude, um, you know, of this um, or extremeness of this particular event, they've actually held up pretty well, despite, you know, some particular locations really, um, or, or some great control structures not being maintained. Right, which is, I'm not blaming the fault to anyone now, I'm just saying that these, in some areas, they've been particularly being poorly maintained and in some areas they've actually held up fairly well. So they've done a great job, um, but essentially they do need repair and replacement. So the report has found or determined that um, of the 12 grade control structures that plus one particular rock beaching um, that were um, investigated or reported on, Six of those need some form of repair or replacement, sorry, repair or maintenance. And the other six need um, completely rebuild. Um, so they're completely detrimental and need to be, they need to be replaced. Um, plus the reports also found, I think there's another uh, three structures that actually need to be built on top of that um, to really get that, you know, to maintain the stability of the system. The report has found that there are, 
you know, the repair, replacement, rebuild, installation of all those structures, along with um, a fully integrated revegetation program, which Julian touched on, and the stock exclusion program, which basically means the fencing of the waterway to a certain width, which I'll touch on soon, because that recommendation is up to 20 metres. Um, we'll, and I'll, I'll talk about that in depth very shortly. Um, as well as a weed management uh, program, which is essentially targeting the willows, which are deemed as a threat, generally touched on the black willow before, uh, to the stability of the system. So your rebuild and replacement, your revegetation, your stock exclusion program and the, in, the water infrastructure you know, um, that supports that and um, the weed management, you're looking at, a, the report has found that that is approximately $1.7 million to, to do so. So um, the, the quandary that we're in is that the Northeast CMA, which is who I represent, we are funded by the Victorian state government primarily and um, essentially we are not funded for, um, I suppose, the repair or maintenance of private infrastructure or that, that, that protects private infrastructure. In fact, <clears throat> these days, it's very, very hard or difficult for us now because of state and federal funding um, to even protect public infrastructure. The guidelines that are becoming increasingly difficult. Now, of course, this is, speaking of difficult, this is really, really hard um, for particularly the landholders in the Bagoyi Creek who have, you know, they've been there for generations and have a long, long standing um, within, the, within the community and have dealt with the CMA and its predecessors in many formats um, and who are, I suppose, familiar with um, maintenance programs where, for example, before Northeast CMA, before 1996, I think it was, or 1993 maybe, um, James will know <laughs> better than me, um, that you know, with the Ovens River Trust Management Board, for example, we, we were funded on a levy basis. So we're funded by landholders to actually go out there and, and do rock. Um, now, the Northeast CMA now is, is essentially, we, I mean, we can only really provide about $2,000 approximately at the moment per landholder or per property, um, per rock structure. Now that's only gonna get you about, you know, 20, maybe 50 meters of rock, if, if you're lucky. So essentially it's, yeah, it's the Northeast CMA, it's very, very difficult for us to help fund the maintenance of these particular assets, uh, given our funding criteria at currently. And I'll, I can touch on that you know, a bit more. Um, in a second. Um, before I do that, is there any questions at the moment? <laughs> oh, Craig, it's Cecily, and I Cecily. appreciate that um, that's, you know, that's the position that NECMA are in. However, I, I feel that it's based on some um, perhaps a limited thinking about the asset of a, a creek. And I, I think, and this is epitomised in Begoigi Creek, but it would hold for many others, it's not actually a private asset. Um, certainly those landholders who adjoin it have, um, you know, particular interest and stake in its well-being and its health and are feeling keenly the impact of its, uh, you know, erosion and, and its um, degradation. But the, the quality of our waterways is surely recognisable as a public good and the habitat that it provides and the cleanliness of the water that's delivered downstream um, depends upon a shared interest in maintaining those creeks and um, and the way that they operate, um, I think that it's it's hard for us as a community to just say, well, you know, it, an individual landholder is not going to be able to find that sort of money to look after it, um, and it's not as though they are the only ones who benefit from it. But in the end, what we've seen is that. Um, it's left up to them and 
those who can and, and you know, are making the effort put in all their effort and money and it's not matched or enabled by a public contribution. And then I'd also add, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, I know you, I don't have to convince you, but I think that um, it's important to state it. And uh, the, the more clearly we think this way and are able to advocate for it, I think that the stronger our position is because um, the investment in something that's a public asset, you know, the, the government might put in, you know, for every dollar that they put in, a landholder's contributing a dollar and they're leveraging the community in kind support as well. And so, you know, it's a value add. And it's not as though that anyone's sitting back and saying, oh, well, you know, the government has to fund to fix all of the waterways across the Northeast. Now, that'd be ridiculous. But if those waterways are identified as a public asset, a community interest is formed, then um, there's a co-investment there and a great opportunity to benefit um, the, the environment as well as the community. And, and I think the more we, we need to do this in terms of climate action and climate change, um, because the consequences, if we don't, are, are going to be felt by everybody. So that's my little soapbox, <laughs> and I don't expect you to be able to respond, but um, I just think that that's the way the conversation should be taken. Thanks, Cecily, that's, that's great. Cecily, um, sorry, is there any other questions before, because I, I can respond? <laughs> Maybe not um, satisfactorily, but I can. Any other questions before I continue? I think we have to keep moving, Craig. We're getting, it's cool. nine o'clock, so. Yeah, um, okay, look. Essentially, essentially, you're 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 right. And um, look, the the assets, the, the protection of these assets does have a public benefit, and the report makes that very very clear. And um, that's something that you know the group, the Landcare Group, need to to use a, a, as a group, as a community, and to to you know to garner more support for funding in the future. Um, and I look I, very, very quickly. Can I do two minutes, Sally? Is that okay? Or? Yep. Yeah, yeah, great. Look, I just wanted to, because some of the things that um, Cecily touched on are, are in, I suppose, sorry, second, what I'm just going to talk about next. So I just wanted to talk about, you know, real, uh, emphasize some of the um, funding constraints that the Northeast CMA has because of our investors, which is the state government. So the state government. Um, has a strategy, which is a Victorian waterway management um, strategy. It, it's, it's essentially a framework for how the CMAs across Victoria, along with community groups and um, other organisations, are funded for waterway health programs. All right? And essentially, um, the, the, the strategy outlines that the best way the, the government sees improving waterway health for, the, for most efficiently um, and most effectively is through um, revegetation, woody weed management, and um, uh, grazing control, which is essentially you know stock restriction. Um, so, with with that in mind, um, I just wanted to touch on some of the key priorities that that we are restricted by, which also talks about some of Cecily's questions. But so Cecily mentioned before, you know. Government funding cannot address all the waterway management issues in every waterway across Victoria. So, you know, I know that's obvious, but I just wanted to, you know, it, it's very clear in our strategy and I wanted to, to mention it as well. You know, we only have a, a certain pool bucket of funding and, and I'm not trying to be nasty about this by any ways, but, you know, just keep in mind that I've, I just mentioned there's a figure of $1.7 million that the report has indicated is required to repair these structures. Now, I think there's probably about a dozen, a dozen and a half of landholders. It's all pretty much on freehold property. And I'm just playing, you know, devil's advocate here. You know, it's a, it's a particularly tough sell. So I want to be honest, and you know, we've got a big challenge ahead of us. Because, um, you know, I support you guys and so does CMI. We want to see these works happen. But I'm just laying it out for you. We've got a really big challenge ahead of us to convince our investors, the state government, to get this done. And $1.7 million, the first question we're gonna ask is, why should the state government pay $1.7 million for, you know, 
a dozen or a dozen and a half of, of, um, of freehold properties. Anyway, I'm just playing devil's advocate. The second policy or, or uh, factor is that government investment must be directed to activities that provided the most efficient and effective long-term improvement in waterway condition and the greatest community benefit. So I touched on that before. I mentioned that under this current strategy, the government now sees revegetation, stock exclusion, and woody weed control as the three best ways to, do, to deliver waterway health. Okay, not rock. Community groups are vital for undertaking work in areas that are a local priority and for attracting additional sources of funding. So this is great for your group because you have got that support. You've got that push now from the from the Big Woody Creek. You know, to really put a case to get, you've got, a, you've got a, a document, a report by Alluvium that sets out the case for improving, uh, for maintaining and repairing these structures and the public benefit, which I'll get to in a second, of doing so. And, you know, that's an independent report, it's independent from government, and it's something that you can use, which you already have used for a couple of landholders already to improve a rock structure. And it's something you need to continue to use and, and, and hammer in you know our politicians face to make sure they're aware of how important and what and how important i suppose of the support you have from the from the community so a collective force basically government intervention to improve waterway condition is only warranted where the benefits you know exceed the cost well essentially it's you know basically saying it comes back to the maintenance thing here now, James touched on it before, you know, it's so important that these sites are maintained. And look, I've, as a CMA representative, I've only been around for a few years, but I can certainly put my hand up and say, you know, there is plenty of assets, whether it's rock or weed control or revegetation, where the CMA has been actively involved in, in funding those, those assets or those sites in the past, and we haven't delivered in terms of maintaining those sites. And restoration ecology 101 is all about, you know, going back and maintaining, you know, otherwise it's just a waste of everybody's money and everybody's time. So, you know, the, the CMA has, has, has to do better at that, but so do the landholders that the CMA or our predecessors have funded in the past. And that's, you know, I'm not trying to attack anyone there. We, we know much more now than we did in the past. We're much more aware of these sort of factors. But again, we have to demonstrate to our investors' government, how are we going to show that we are going to maintain these sites in the future so that money isn't wasted. And the CMA is doing that now through, through much more robust and rigorous management agreements. You know, some of these management agreements are now at least 10 years and some are perpetual and they're quite stringent and really, you know, they carry a bit of a stick. So is that I'm really finished? Sally. <laughs> um, management activities will focus on maintaining or improving the environmental condition of priority waterways to provide public benefits. Well, the public benefit for improving these grade control structures is the Ovens River. Okay, and if we don't fix these grade control structures, we're going to see a huge influx of sediment into that waterway. And that has really, and Julian touched on this before, it has really detrimental impacts to uh, ecological, um, you know, really detrimental ecological impacts to our critters, you know, so our fish, uh, our macro invertebrates, and all the all the um, organisms that thrive or support from those organisms, our birds, etc. Um, it also has impacts on our downstream assets, whether it's um, assets by northeast water um, or Golden Murray Golden Murray water in terms of um, our utilities, for example. Um, and this is something again, you know. This, this is real and we need to really push that. So there is a benefit uh, in, our, in our roads and our bridges as well, of course, you know, whether it's Vic roads or uh, regional roads, Victoria now I think it is. Um, so, you know, th these structures have, have really, I mean, the report makes very clear that without these structures in place, we would have seen a deepening of up to 15 metres and a widening of, I think, over 100 metres, um, which Julian sort of touched on before as well. That's a huge amount of sentiment. You know, I can't emphasize how much. And I think finally, you know, private individual benefits will be supported where they do not significantly compromise the public interest, which is pretty obvious. And I think that's it. So 
you know, th these are some of the, um, as I said, guiding principles upon this framework that we are restricted to. Um, as I said, you've got a document now by Alluvium um, and yeah, we need to use it and get everyone behind it. I think that's it for me. <laughs> that's good, Craig. Thank you. Um, look, I think, um, you know, I've, a bit like Julian, I've worked in this waterway management space for the last 15 years and I see that we're really entering a new phase now where um, what was done in the past and what could be funded in the past is very different to what's going to be funded in the future. And I think where that places us is that we all need to be very proactive in trying to manage our waterways better to, to not let them get as degraded um, and to start working together collaboratively and, and as, as Cicely was saying, you know, jointly funding projects together where we can. So leveraging off each other and, and whether that's through land care, applying the pressure as Craig has, um, you know, suggested and working hand in hand with NECMA and all of the private landholders together. Because if, as Julian mentioned earlier, if we just repair single structures in this reach of 13 structures, it's not going to achieve the overall outcome that we need. So we need to collectively look at the whole reach as a whole for stability and work from there. And I think it's, it's really important that vegetation is going to be a key, a key player in this. And certainly that alluvium report did highlight that one of the structures that performed the best was the one that had a lot of revegetation that was successful around it. And that's building on the concepts that Julian was talking about where when we increase roughness through those areas, those trees, grasses, logs, um, you know, some of that power is expended on going over those as opposed to actually removing sediment from the bed. So I think definitely new phase and Craig, you, you've got enough, something else you'd like to add? Uh, look, sorry, Sally, I just wanted to emphasize something you just said that you're absolutely right. Um, you can't just achieve what, you know, by, by one or two or three or four, you know, properties or, or landholders. Um, I'm not sure from memory this is actually emphasised in the report, but the report's authors have made it very clear that we need at least 75, 80% of landholders to actually come to the party in terms to, you know, for this, for the report's recommendations to be actually effective. So it's not, I just really want to emphasise, it's not something that one or two people can actually, you know, do all the hard work and expect yeah. to get you know, while others expect the benefits. It needs to be collective. That's all, sorry. <laughs> and, I, and I think Landcare is really placed to galvanise that and to work together so that, you know, when everyone contributes towards that, um, that the overall outcome is, is probably got a greater chance of being, of being achieved. Um, 